I think that both of us simultaneously cried out in mixed awe, wonder, terror and disbelief in our own senses as we finally cleared the pass and saw what lay beyond. Of course we must have had some natural theory in the back of our heads to steady our facilities for a moment. Probably we thought of such things as grotesquely weathered stones of the Garden of the Gods in Colorado, the fantastically symmetrical wind-carved rocks in the Arizona desert. Perhaps we even half thought of the sight of the mirage like the one we had seen the morning before on our first approach in those mountains of madness. We must have had such normal notions to fall back upon our eyes, swept the limitless, tempest-scarred plateau, and grasped the almost endless abyss of colossal, regular, and geometrically rhythmic stones masses which reared their crumbled and pitted crests above the glacial sheet not more than forty or fifty feet deep in its thickest, and in places obviously thinner. The effect of the monstrous sight was indescribable, for some fiendish violation of no natural law seemed certain at the outset. Here, on a hellishly ancient tableland fully twenty thousand feet high, and in a climate deadly to habitation since pre-human age no less than five hundred thousand years ago, there stretched nearly on the vision's limit a tangle of ordinary stone of which only the desperation of mental self-defence could possibly attribute to any but a conscious and artificial cause. We had previously dismissed, so far as serious thought was concerned, any theory that the cubes and ramparts of the mountainsides were other than natural in origin. How could they be otherwise? when man himself could scarcely have been differentiated from the great apes and the time and this region succumbed to the present unbroken reign of glacial death. Yet now the sway of reason seemed infuriatedly shaken, for this cyclopean maze of squared, curved and angled blocks had features which cut off from the comfortable refuge. It was, very clearly, the blasphemous city of the mirage and stark objective, an eluctable reality. The damnable potent had been material basis after all. There had been some horizontal stratum of ice dust in the upper air, and this shock and stone survival had projected its image across the mountains according to the simple laws of reflection. Of course the phantom had been twisted and exaggerated, and had contained things which the real source did not contain. Yet now, as we saw the real source, we thought it was even more hideous and menacing than its distant image. Only the incredible unhuman massiveness of those vast stone towers and ramparts had saved the frightful thing from utter annihilation in the hundreds and thousands, perhaps millions of years it had brooded there amidst the blasts of a bleak upland. Corona Mundi, Roof of the World all sorts of fantastic phrases sprang to our lips as we looked dismally down upon the unbelievable spectacle. I thought again of the eldritch primal myths that had so persistently haunted me since my first sight of this dead Antarctic world. Of the demonic plateau of Lang, of the Migo, of the abominable snowmen of the Himalayas, of the pneumatic manuscripts of the pre-human implications, of the Cthulhu cult, of the Necronomicon, of the Hyperborean legends of formless Thagoshua and worse than formless star spawn associated with that semi-entity. Of boundless miles in every direction the thing stretched off, with very little thinning, indeed as our own eyes followed it into the right and left along the base of the low, gradual foothills which separated it from the actual mountain rim, we decided that we could go no thinning except for the interruption of the left of the pass through of which we had come. We had merely struck, at random, a limited part of something so incalculable extent. The foothills were more sparsely sprinkled with the grotesque stone structures, linking the terrible city as to the familiar cubes and ramparts which evidently formed its mountain outpost. These latter, as well as some of the queer cave mouths, were as thick on the inner as on the outer sides of the mountains. The nameless stone labyrinth consisted, for the most part, of walls from 10 to 150 feet in ice-clear height, of a thickness of varying from 5 to 10 feet. It was composed mostly of prodigious blocks of dark primordial slate, synths and sandstone, block in many cases as large as 4 by 6 by 8 feet though in several places it seemed to be carved out of solid, uneven bedrock of Precambrian slate. 
the buildings were far from equal in size, there being innumerable honeycomb arrangements of enormous extent as well as the smaller separate structures. The general shape of these things tended to be conical, pyramidal, or terraced through there were many perfect cylinders, perfect cubes, clusters of cubes, and other rectangular forms, of peculiar sprinkling of angled edifices whose five-pointed ground plain roughly shaped modern fortifications. The builders had made a constant and expert use of the principle of their arch and domes and had probably existed in the city's heyday. The whole tangle was monstrously weathered and the glacial surfaces from which the towers projected was strewn on with fallen blocks of immemorial debris. Where the glacian was transparent, we could see the lower parts of the gigantic pillars and notice the ice-preserved stone bridges which connected the different towers of varying distances above the ground. On the exposed walls we could detect the sacred places where the other and higher bridges of the same sort had existed. Closer inspection revealed countless largest windows, some of which were closed with shutters and petrified material originally wood, though most gaped open in the sinister and menacing fashion. Many of the ruins, of course, were roofless, and with uneven three-window rounded upper edges, whilst others of a more shapely conical or pyramidal model or else protected by higher surrounding structures, preserved intact outlines dispense the omnipresent crumbling and pitying. With the field glass we could barely make out what seemed to be a sculptural decorations in horizontal bands, decorations including those curious groups of dots which presence on the ancient soapstones now assumed a vast larger significance. In many places the buildings were totally ruined and the ice sheet deeply riven from the vigorous geological causes. In other places the stonework was worn down by the very level of the glacian, on broad swarth extending from the plateau's interior to a cleft in the foothills about a mile to the left in the pass which we had traversed, was wholly free from buildings and probably represented, we concluded, the course of some great river with the territory times millions of years ago. We had poured through the city and into the prodigious subterranean abyss of the Great Barrier Range. Certainly this was above all the region caves, gulfs and underground secrets beyond human potential. Looking back at our sensations and recalling our dazedness of viewing this monstrous survival from eons we had thought pre-human, I can only wonder what we preserved the semblance of equilibrium which we did. Of course we knew that something was chronologically, scientifically theory of our own consciousness was woefully weary. Yet we kept enough poise to guide the plane, observed many things quite minutely and taken careful series of photographs which may yet serve both of us and the world in good stead. In my case, ingrained scientific habit may have helped, for above all my bewilderment and sense of menace there burned a dominant curiosity to fathom more of this old age secret, to know what sort of beings had built and lived in this incredibly gigantic place and what relation to the general world of its time or for those other times so unique and concentration of life could have had. For this place could be no ordinary city. It must have formed the primary nucleus of the centre of some archaic and unbelievable chapter of Earth's history, whose outward ramifications recalled only dimly in the most obscure and distorted myths had vanished utterly amidst the chaos and terrence convulsions along before any human race we have known had shambled its way out of the Pomodium. Here sprawled a paleogen or megalopolis compared with the fabled Atlantis and Lumeria, Comorium, Usildorium and Othraho in the land of Lumar and the recent things of today, not even of yesterday, a megalopolis rankling with such whispered pre-human blasphemies as Volsria, Relie, Ib, the land of Nar, the nameless city of Arab Dasra. We flew above the tangle of stark titan towers and my imagination sometimes escaped all bounds and revolved aimlessly in realms of fantastic associations. Even wavering links betwixt the lost world and some of my own wildest dreams concerning the mad horrors at the camp. The plane's fuel tank, in the interest of greater lightness, had been only partly filled. Hence we now had to extort caution of our explorations. Even so, however, we covered an enormous extent of ground, 
or rather er, after swooping down to a level where the wind became virtually neglectable. There seemed to be no limit to the mountain range, to the length of the frightful stone city, which bombarded its inner foothills. Fifty miles of flight in each direction showed no major change in the labyrinth of rock or masonry that crawled up the corpse-like through the eternal ice. There were, though, some highly absorbing diversifications such as carvings on the, in the canyon, where the broad river had once pierced the foothills and approached its sinking place in the Great Range. The headlands at the stream's entrance had been boldly carved into the cyclopean pylons, and something about the riggy, barrel-shaped design stirred up oddly vague, hateful and confusing semi-remembrances in both Danforth and me. We also came upon several star-shaped open spaces, evidently public squares, and noted various undulations in the terrain. Where a sharp hill rose was generally hollowed out into some sort of rambling stone edifice, but there were at least two exceptions. Of these latter, one was too badly weathered to disclose of what had been on the jutting em eminence, while the other still bore a fantastic conical mounted carved out of the solid rock and roughly resembling such things as the well-known snake tomb in the ancient valley of Petra. Flying inland from the mountains, we discovered that the city was not infinite width, even though its length along the foothill seemed endless. After about thirty miles, the grotesque stone buildings began to thin out, and in ten more miles we came to an unbroken waste virtually without signs of sentient artifice. The course of the river beyond the city seemed marked by a broad, depressed line, whilst the land assumed a somewhat greater ruggedness, seeming to slope slightly upward in its receded in the mist, hazed west. As far as we had no landing, yet to leave the plateau without an attempt at entering some of the monstrous structures would have been inconceivable. Accordingly, we decided to find smooth place in the foothills near the Navigal Pass, there grounding the plain to and preparing to some exploration on foot. Though these gradual slopes were partly covered with the scattering of ruins, low flying soon disclosed an ample number of possible landing places. Selecting that nearest to the pass, since our next flight could be across a great range of back to the camp, we succeeded at about 12.30pm in coming down on a smooth, hard snowfield, wholly devoid of obstacles and well adapted to the swift and favourable takeoff later on. It did not seem necessary to protect the plane with a snowbank and for such a brief time, and in so comfortable an absence of high winds at this level. Hence we merely saw that the landing skis were safely lodged and that the vital parts of the mechanism were guarded against the cold. For our foot journey we discovered the heaviest of our flying furs, and we took with us a small outfit consisting of pocket compass, head camera, light provisions, voluminous notebooks and paper, geologist hammer and chisel, specimen bags, coil for climbing rope, and powerful electric torches with extra batteries. This equipment having been carried in the plane on the chance that we might be able to effect a landing, take ground pictures, make drawings of topographical sketches and obtain rock specimens for some bare slope, outcropped in our mountain cave. Fortunately, we had supply of extra paper to tear up, place the spur specimen bag and use the ancient pinnacle of her and hounds of marking, of course, in any interior mazes we might be able to penetrate. This had been brought in case we found some cave system with er quiet enough to allow such rapid and easy method in place of the usual rock chipping method of trailblazing. Walking cautiously downhill over the crusted snow towards the stupendous stone labyrinth that loomed against the omnipresent west, we felt almost a keen sense of eminent marvels as we felt upon approaching the unfathomed mountain pass four hours previously. True, we had become visually familiar with the incredible secret concealed by the barrier peaks, yet the prospect of actually entering primordial walls reared by conscious beings perhaps millions of years ago, before any known race of men could have existed, was nonetheless awesome and potentially terrible in its implications of cosmic abnormality. Though the thinness of the error at this prodigious altitude made exertion somewhat more difficult than usual, both Danforth and I found ourselves burrowing up very well. We felt an equal to almost any task which might fall to our lot, 
and took only a few steps to bring us to a shapeless ruin, worn level with the snow, while ten or fifteen rods further by the huge roofless rampart, still complete with this gigantic five-point outline and rising to the irregular height of ten or eleven feet. For this ladder, we headed and, when at last we were able to actually touch its weathered cyclopean blocks, we felt that we had established an unprecedented and almost blasphemous link with forgotten eons of normally closed out of our species. This rampart, shaped like the star of perhaps 300 feet from the point to point, was built of Jurassic sandstone blocks of irregular size, averaging 6 by 8 feet in surface. There was a row of arched loopholes or windows about 4 feet wide and 5 feet high, spaced quite symmetrically along the points of the star and its inner angles. And with the bottoms about four feet from the glaciated surface, looking through these we could see that the masonry was fully five feet thick and that there were no partitions remaining within, and that there were traces of banded carvings or bas reliefs in the interior walls. Facts that we have indeed guessed before when flying over the low rampart and any others like it. Though lower parts must have existed, all traces of such things were now wholly obscure by deep layer of ice and snow at this point. We crawled through one of the windows and vainly tried to decipher the nearly affected muriel designs, but did not attempt to disturb the glaciated floor. Our orientation flights had indicated that many buildings of the city proper were less ice-choked, and that we might perhaps find wholly clear interiors leading down into the true ground level if we entered those structures still roofed at the top. Before we left the rampart we photographed it carefully, and studied its maratlinous cyclopean masonry with complete bewilderment. We wished that Peabody were present, for his engineering knowledge might have helped us guess how much titanic blocks could have been handled in that unbelievably remote age when the city and its outskirts were built up. The half-mile walk downhill to the actual city with its upper and wind shrieking vainly and savagely through the skyward peaks in the background was something whose smallest details will always remain engraved in my mind. Only in fantastic nightmares could any human beings but Danforth and me conceive such optical effects. Between us and the churning vapours of the west lay in the monstrous tangle of dark stone towers. Its outrere of incredible forms impressing us afresh at every new angle of vision. It was a mirage in solid stone, and were it not for the photographs I would still doubt that such a thing could be. The general type of masonry was identical with that of the rampart that we had examined, but the extravagant shapes with this masonry took on its urban manifestations were past all description. Even the pictures illustrate only one or two phases of its infinite bizarre, endless variety, perpanatural massiveness and utterly alien ecstasism. There were geometrical forms of which Euclid could scarcely find a name, cones of all degrees of irregularity and transaction, terraces of every sort of provocative disproportion, shafts of odd bulbous enlargements, broken columns and curious groups of five-pointed or five-ridged arrangements of mad grotesqueness. As we drew near, we could see beneath certain transparent parts of the ice sheet and detect some of the tubular stone buildings that connected the crazily sprinkled structures at various heights. Of ordinarily streets, there seemed to be none, the only broad open swath being a mile to the left, where the ancient river had doubtless flowed through the town and into the mountains. Our field glasses showed the external horizon brands of nearly affected sculptures of dot groups to be very prevalent, and we could half imagine that the city must have once looked like, even though most of the roofs and tower tops had necessarily perished. As a whole, it had been a complex tangle of twisted lanes and alleys, all of them deep canyons and some little better than tunnels because of the overhanging masonry and overarching bridges. Now outspread below us, it loomed, like a dream fantasy against the westward mist through those northern end in the low reddish Antarctic sun of the early afternoon was struggling to shine, and for a moment the sun encountered a denser obstruction and plunged the scene into temporary shadow. The effect was subtly menacing in a way that I can never hope to depict. Even the faint howling and piping of the unfelt wind in the great mountain passes beyond 
looked on a wilder note of purposeful malignity. The last stage of our descent to the town was unusually steep and abrupt, but the rock I cropped in at the edge was the grade changed as to that artificial terrace that once existed there. Under the glacion, we believed there must be a flight of steps or its equivalent. When at last we plunged into the labyrinthine town itself, clambered over fallen masonry and shrinking from the oppressive nearness and dwarfing heights of the omnipresent crumbling of pitted walls, our sensations again became such I marvelled at the amount of self-control we retained. Danforth was frankly jumpy and began making some offensively irreverent speculations about the horror of the camp, which I resented it more because I could not help but share in the certain conclusion forced upon me us by many means features of the morbid survival from nightmare antiquity. The speculations worked on its imagination too for the one place where a debris literally alley turned into the sharp corner he insisted that he saw a faint traces of the ground markings which he did not like, whilst elsewhere he stopped to listen to the subtle, imaginary sound from some undefined point, a muffled musical piping, he said, not unlike that with the wind of the mountain caves, yet somehow disturbingly different. The ceaseless five-pointedness of the surrounding architecture in the few distinguishable mural arbences had dimly sinister suggestiveness that we could not escape and give us a touch of terrible and subconsciousness certainly concerning the primal entities which had reared its dwelt in the unhallowed place. Nevertheless, our scientific and adventurous souls were not wholly dead, and were mechanically carried out of a program of chipping specimens from all different rock types represented in the masonry. We wished a rather large set of full to draw about our conclusions regarding the age of the place. Nothing the great outer walls seemed to date from larger than the Jurassic and Comanchean periods, nor was any of this piece of stone in the entire place of a greater resonancy than the Philistine age. In stark certainty we were wandering amidst the death of which had regained at least 500,000 years, in all probability even longer. As we proceeded through the maze of stone shadowed twilight, we stopped at all available apertures to study interiors and investigate entrances' possibilities. Some of which were out of reach, while others led only into ice-choked ruins and unroofed and barren to the rampant on the hill. One, though spacious and inviting, opened on a seamlessly bottomless abyss without visible means of descent. Now and then we had a chance to study the petrified wood of a surviving shutter, and were impressed by the fabulous antiquity implied in its still discernible green. These things had come from the mesotonic genosperms and confiners, especially the Cretaceous cyads, and from fan palms and early agnosperms and plainly ter territory date. Nothing definitely later than the Philistine and could be discovered. In the placing of these shutters, whose edges showed the former presence of the queer and long valished hinges, used usage seemed to be varied, some being on the outer and some on the inner side of the deep embraces. They seemed to have become wedged in place, thus surviving the rustling of their former and probably metallic fixtures and fastenings. After a time we came across a row of windows, in the bulges of the colossal five-ridged cone of undamaged apex, which led into a vast, well-preserved room with stone flooring. But they were too high in the room to permit the descent without a rope. We had a rope with us, we did not wish to bother with this twenty-foot drop unless obliged to especially in this thin plateau air, with great demands were made upon the hard action. The enormous room was probably a hall, or concourse of some sort, and our electrical torches showed bold, distinct and potentially startling sculptures arranged round the walls in broad horizontal bands, separated into equally broad strips of our conventional arabesques. We took careful note of this spot, planning to enter here unless more easily gained interior were encountered. Finally, though, we did encounter exactly the opening we wished. An archway about six feet wide and ten feet high marked the former end and an aerial bridge which spanned an alley about five feet above the present level of Glacion. These archways, of course, were flush with the upper story floors and in this case one of the floors still existed. 
The building, thus accessible, was a series of rectangular terraces on the left, facing westward. That across at the alley that the other's archway yawned, and was decrepit cylinder with no windows and was curious bulge about ten feet above the aperture. It was totally dark inside, and the archway seemed to open up on a wall of illimited emptiness. Heaped debris made the entrance to the vast left-hand building doubtfully easy, yet for a moment we hesitated before taking advantage of the long-wished chance. For though we had penetrated into the tangle of archaic mystery, it required fresh revolution to carry us actually inside and complete a surviving building of fabulous elder world whose nature was becoming more and more hideously plain to us. In the end, however, we made the plunge and scrambled up to the rubble and into the gaping embrance. The floor beyond was of great slate slabs and seemed to form the outlet of long, high corridor with sculpted walls. Observing many inner archways which led off from it and realising that the probable complexity of the nest of apartments within, we decided that we must begin our system of her and hound trailblazing. Hitherto our compasses, together with the fragrant glimpses of the vast mountain range between the towers in our rear, had been enough to prevent our losing our way. But from now on, the artificial substitute would be necessary. Accordingly, we reduced the extra paper to shreds of suitable sizes, placed these in a bag carried by Danforth, and prepared to use them as economically and safely as would allow. This method would probably gain us an immunity from strain, since there did not seem to be appear to be strong air currents inside the primordial masonry. If such should develop, or in the paper supply should give out, we could of course fall back to the more secure through the tenderous and retarding method of rock chipping. Just how extensive a territory had we opened up? It was impossible to guess without a trail. The close of frequent connection to the different buildings made it very likely that it might cross from one to another on bridges, underneath the ice except where the implanted local collapses of geologist rifts. For every little glacion seemed to have entered a massive construction. Almost all areas of transparent and ice had been revealed by submerged windows as tightly shuttered, as if the town had been left in the uniform state until a glacial sheet came to crystallise the lower part of the succeeding time. Indeed, one gained curious imp impression of this place had been deliberately closed and deserted for some dim bygone aeon, rather than the overwhelmed by a sudden calamity or even gradual decay. Had the coming of the ice been foreseen, and had the nameless population left an in mess to seek a less doomed boat? The precise philosophical conditions attending the formation of ice sheet at this point would have to wait for a later solution. It had not, very plainly, been a grind and drive. Perhaps the pressure of accumulated snows had been responsible, and perhaps some flood from the river or from the busting of some ancient glacial dam in the Great Range had helped to create the special state now observable. Imagination could conceive almost anything in connection with this place. <laughs>